Once was a time in Egypt land The Jews were slaves in the desert sand We cried out for an outstretched hand Oh, let, let my, my people, people go <gasps> Soon may our freedom come To bring us liberty, peace and fun One day when the Pharaoh's outdone He'll let my people go Brave Moses with his shepherd's rod Had heard the mighty voice of God It said, tell Pharaoh clear and strong To let, let my people go <gasps> Soon may our freedom come to bring us liberty, peace, and fun. One day when the Pharaoh's outdone, he'll let my people go. Oh, what shall we do with the middle matzah? What shall we do with the middle matzah? What shall we do with the middle matzah? Or lie in the Seder. Hide it away is the Afik Goldman. Hide it away is the Afik Goldman. Hide it away is the Afik Goldman. Or lie in the Seder. Seder. Soon may our freedom come to bring us liberty, peace, and fun. One day when the Pharaoh's outdone, he'll let my people go. Now Pharaoh's heart was not appeased. No, no Hebrew slave, slave shall ever go free. But Moses said, let's wait and see. The plagues began to grow. Oy! Soon may our freedom come to bring us liberty, peace, and fun. One day when the Pharaoh's outdone, he'll let my people go. Just lean to the left and we'll tell the tale of how we left Egypt God split the sea and we walked across with no need for a ship But first before we get to that, there's sons and questions for Just when you think it's almost done, there's three hours more There's three hours more For Pharaoh sent men after us, their lives would soon be lost and we spill wine drops from our cups Cause freedom had a cost Cause freedom had a cost So every year we celebrate Our freedom with a smile With Moses and Ramses too Questions asked by the youngest one We'll sing and have some fun For wonders long ago Egyptian firstborn sons were lost The sea of reeds we firmly crossed They followed but was at great cost They all were dragged below Hey lads, the Seder is done We told our tale of redemption The Shana Habba Yerushalayim I'll tell you why I love that video. I love that video because right at the beginning, it sent the message that this is not going to be another one of those boring seven hour seders. It's gonna be a 10 hour seder. No, no, only kidding. We want to welcome you here, and uh, my goodness, it's so, so wonderful to be back in Grand Junction. Have a couple of questions for you. The first is, uh, how many of you were, were, were here last year when we did this? Quite a few of you. Okay, so hands down there. And then, how many of you are, are here for the uh, very, very, how many of you, this is your first ever Passover say to raise your hands? Wow, that's amazing. Really? Me too. So, um... <laughs> I told you, listen, we're going to have entirely too much fun tonight. It's going to be deeply spiritual. We are going to find Jesus in a place in the scriptures where he's always been. He's been waiting for us to find him. We just maybe never had the opportunity to discover him in the Passover festival. But we're going to do that tonight. And we are lively and we are joyful because it's a celebration. We're not slaves anymore. And of course, tonight I want to let you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm so, so glad that so many of you came out. And as I was meeting some of you at the door, it was great. You didn't know what to expect. 
because you came in. Somebody said, that's Rabbi Jack Zimmerman. And you shook my hand and I, and I shook yours. And some of you even asked me, I think there were two people who asked me, I have to answer the question for you. You said, so Rabbi, what do you eat? <laughs> and, and I said, um, you know, food, um, you know. I, I, I do, I have that. And they said, no, you know, do you eat pork, you know, or bacon? Okay, so I'm, a, I, I'm a, a, a Messianic rabbi, so a rabbi who believes in Jesus, but I'm also an ordained pastor. So the rabbi in me will not touch pork, but the pastor in me loves it. Okay, are we good? <laughs> all right, so I just want to get that out of the way. All right, and thank you, by the way, Pastor Jeff, for letting them know that I'm a believer in Jesus. That's a good way to start things off because that way you guys, you guys won't you know, try to spend the entire night trying to figure out how to get me saved. So we're good. We're good. We're good. Want to welcome you here. I just want to let you know that particularly for you first timers, even though Passover is traditionally recognized as a quote unquote Jewish festival, we're not here tonight to do a Jewish thing. It's not Jewish night in Grand Junction, Colorado. Okay. We're here to glorify Jesus tonight. We are here to find and discover and fully understand the Passover lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And of course, what we'll do tonight is we'll be doing a lot of connecting the Old Testament story of Passover to the New Testament fulfillment, connecting the dots, because there's really one word that ties this story together, and that's the word redemption. So what I want to do is let me give you just a little bit of a summary of the Old Testament Passover story. Then I'll talk about the New Testament fulfillment, and then we'll get started with our Seder. First of all, you need to know that the reason we have something called Passover in the first place is because about 3,500 years ago, a whole lot of people got really hungry, and there was no food. There was a famine in the land of Israel. Abraham and his family went through it. Abraham's son Isaac and his family went through it. And Isaac's son Jacob and his family went through it. And there's a story in the book of Genesis where obviously every time the family went through it, they left Israel for a while. When Jacob and his family went through it, they left Israel for 250 years. They moved to Egypt where there was plenty of food. And you know why? It's because some 20 years earlier, one day, Jacob's 12 sons were working in the field. 11 of his sons sold their brother Joseph into slavery. He ended up being falsely accused, thrown in jail, interpreted a dream for the Pharaoh of Egypt. And the Pharaoh said, Joseph, I'm going to make you second in command of my kingdom. And when Joseph was given that title and authority, Joseph said, your majesty, there's going to be a famine coming seven years. And you need to allow me to store food in the storehouses so that before the famine comes, there'll be enough food for seven years to feed the people of Egypt. And little did anyone, Joseph or anyone else, realize that the food that Joseph was storing away for the Egyptians would one day go to feed his very own brothers and his own family. Don't you love how God works out a plan so many years in advance? So the Israelites moved to Egypt and they lived there for many, many years in relative peace until one day a new king of Egypt, a new pharaoh came on the throne. And unlike his predecessor, he was not at all happy having all of these Israelites in his land. He was worried that they would gain too much political power and control. So the king issued two decrees. The first decree, he took all of the adult Israelites and put them in chains and bondage and made them slaves. The second decree was that the Pharaoh called for the death of every firstborn male Israelite child. Now, there had been a woman who had given birth, firstborn male Israelite child. She wanted to save the child from the decree. So she placed the child in a basket, sent the basket down the river. You all know, I hope, the child's name was... Yes, praise the Lord. Thank you so much. I appreciate that because that's not the answer I always get. Uh, I did a, a Seder a couple of weeks ago in what I lovingly call the, the Jewish Mecca of the United States of America, Gillette, Wyoming. And, um, <laughs> and I asked that question. You know, we got to the part of the Seder. The woman had the child, placed him in a basket, basket down the river. What was the child's name? And I, no kidding. And there was a guy in the back who said, that was Charlton Heston. I'm like, oh gosh, no. So, Moses, not Charlton Heston, 
was placed in a basket, one day met God at a burning bush. And God said, Moses, those Israelites, they're your people. And I want you to tell the Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. And so Moses went to Pharaoh and told Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. Each time Moses went to the Pharaoh to tell him to let the Israelites go, the Pharaoh said, no. And each time the Pharaoh said no, God brought a plague down on the land. Terrible things began to happen. Water turned to blood. Light turned to dark. Hail fell from the sky. Cattle disease. Frogs jumping around all over the place. After nine of these plagues, the Pharaoh would still not allow the Israelites to go free. And at that point, God said, Moses, I have a tenth and final plague that I will bring down on the land of Egypt. And then the Pharaoh will relent and allow the Israelites to leave. Now listen to what this tenth plague was, because this is the first tie that connects Old Testament to New. God said, Moses, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send for this tenth and final plague my angel of death into the city to strike down every male newborn Egyptian child. But I want to make sure that no Israelite children are harmed in this decree. In fact, when my angel of death comes into the city, I want to make sure that he can tell the difference between an Egyptian home and an Israelite home so that when he sees an Israelite home, he will bring no harm to it. But instead, what he will do is he will pass over it. So Moses, here's how he can tell the difference. Moses, tell the head of every Israelite household to go out and slay a lamb. And scripture says, take the blood from that lamb and smear that blood on the lintel and the doorposts of their houses. Now, you probably know what doorposts are. You might not know what a lintel is. So uh, let's see. Tell you what, I'm looking for a doorway that all of you might be able to see. And there are two. So I'm going to go up actually around the room uh, because, uh, by the way, I'm going to be going around the room a lot tonight, meeting all of you, probably doing some of the demonstrations at your table. There were two reasons for that. Number one, so that we can kind of get up close and, and you know, I can share with you from a personal aspect each part of the Seder. And number two, I'm a New Yorker loaded with coffee so I can't stand still. <laughs> but for everybody first on this side of the room, at each, and don't worry, I'll come over to you, at every doorway, you have two vertical posts, one on each side. See the horizontal bar that goes across on the top? That's known as the lintel of the doorway. I want you to keep that in mind. For our folks on this side of the room, let me show you the illustration I just did for the other folks. At every doorway, you have two vertical doorposts, one on each side. You see the horizontal bar that goes across on the top? That's called the lintel of the doorway. So I want you to think about this. When God told Moses to tell the head of every Israelite household to go out and slay a lamb and take the blood from that lamb and smear that blood on the lintel and the doorpost of their houses, somewhere along the lines when they did that, they would have made one of two shapes. Here's the first one. We smear the blood on a lintel. We smear the blood on a doorpost. Anybody see anything interesting in there? Right. So we have this beautiful imagery of the blood of an innocent spotless lamb that was slain and that blood smeared in the prefigurement of a cross. But it doesn't end there because when you smear the blood on, let's see, a doorpost, a lintel, and a doorpost, you make the shape of a Hebrew letter. It's pronounced chet. And it's the first letter in the Hebrew word chatat, which in English means sin. So now we've got the blood of an innocent spotless lamb smeared in the prefigurement of a cross. And when the Israelites acknowledged that blood, guess what that blood did? That blood covered their sins. Pharaoh allowed the Israelites to leave. Their chains of slavery and bondage came off. They were redeemed. They went out into their promised land. How many of you know that's their story? Guess who else's story it is? Everybody in this room. And it's our story, too, because, well, we have a lot in common with those Israelite slaves. Because guess what? Before we knew Jesus, we, too, were slaves to another Pharaoh, to the devil, to the enemy. But what happened? Jesus, our lamb, came and shed his blood on what just happens to be the fulfillment of a lintel and a doorpost. And when he did that for us, and we acknowledged that blood, you know what that blood did? 
That blood covered our sins. Not only that, even better, it eradicated our sins. Our chains of slavery and bondage came off. We are redeemed and now we have the promise of the promised land of eternal life in heaven. It's good for an amen. Somebody say it. Amen. There you go. So that's why we're doing what we're doing tonight. And of course, it's called a Passover Seder. Everybody say the word Seder. Good. It's not cedar. That's a tree. Now, the Hebrew word Seder actually means order, referring to an order of service, because what we're doing is we're engaging in a holy service tonight, and that's why your table is set up the way it is. And by the way, for those of you who came in a little, uh, a, a little bit later, and, and you know, obviously we told you that, that we have a meal for you, uh, and you came over to the table, and you kind of sat and looked at that plate in the middle, and you went, oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. We do have caterers out in the hallway. We'll be giving you a great meal and real food. But uh, what I want to do is I want to give you a little bit of an idea of the order of our Seder. But first, I want to let you know what you have on your table. So I'll give you a little bit of a description of some of the items and some of the elements. First of all, you'll see at your tables, everyone has a full cup. Actually, it's about a little bit more than a half cup of grape juice. It's not meant as a casual beverage. That's what your cup of water is for, guys. And you'll be partaking of this cup four different times. Each cup goes by a different name. I'll be letting you know what the name is of each cup and its Old Testament significance and its New Testament fulfillment. You also, let's see, have on your table under that napkin. And you know what? Can this table, table number eight, could you open that napkin up? I want to show everybody what you've got. So in your napkins, on your tables, there we go, you actually have three slices of this, of what's called matzah or unleavened bread. And let me just tell you, in case you've never tried this before, you need to know this stuff tastes great <laughs> with something on it. We'll be putting something on it, and so that's what your matzah is for. Let's see, uh, what do we have over here? Oh, yeah, you'll also see that there is a white bowl with a towel on your table and a pitcher of water next to it. We're going to have a hand-washing ceremony. There's, uh, on that round plate, by the way, in the middle that you have, it has uh, several items and elements on it. There also is a smaller cup of water. But unlike the water in that pitcher, this water is kind of cloudy, and, and that's, that's because we brought it in from, you know, La Junta, so don't worry about it. No, I'm only kidding. Shame on me. Come on, I know your state. Uh, let's see. Now, also, guys, over here, uh, in the middle, there is parsley. And uh, who said O oh, for the parsley? Oh, you just got the joke. Okay, that's fine. Don't worry. About it. <laughs> and uh, let's see. Also on your plates in the middle. By the way, that, that, that plate in the middle, surprisingly, amazingly, it's called a Seder plate. Don't you love how that works out? Uh, in the middle, you will see you have a hard-boiled or a roasted egg, and you always leave the shell on. Um, before, Jody, where are you? Jo Jody, you're right over there. And, and Jody was kind enough, by the way, to, and, and I'm so, so glad you did this, because Jody described that mixture that you have in there, that mixture, uh, you know, with nuts or without, and she gave you the English pronunciation, and I'm so glad you did, which is pronounced charoset. And, and the reason that Jody did that, and thank you so much, is because on the one hand, well, uh, on the other hand, it does have a Hebrew pronunciation, which I'll tell you in a minute, but Jody made it easy on you because the Hebrew pronunciation kind of begins with the following sound. <laughs> so I just want to find out, and I'm going to kind of go over here so I can see most of you at once. For how many of you, since you have the rabbi here tonight, would you like to learn the Hebrew pronunciation? Thank you. This is why I love coming to Grand Junction. <laughs> This is great. I go to Florida. It's like, no, no, it's okay. No, no, no. So in Hebrew, it's pronounced, and, and you're going to, you'll do that, but go easy because you have people sitting across from you who like you right now. But in Hebrew, it's pronounced charosis. 
that's wonderful. I saw you cringe. It's okay. We'll work on it after the Seder. Don't worry. And uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. Here's what else we have, and I'm really excited about, well, the last two things. First of all, there is, you have a little cup, kind of this um, off-white, almost creamy mixture. Is it ranch dressing, or, or what is it here? It's actually horseradish. It may be very, very hot horseradish. I don't know. I don't know. I, I didn't look at the label. All I know is that when I tried the horseradish last year, and some of you did, you ran out of the building. We haven't seen you since. <laughs> so that's what that is. And finally, on your uh, Seder plate, last but not least, this is an actual lamb shank bone. And we have like 22, 23 tables. And when we were setting up this Seder, uh, Jody, you had asked me, Craig, you'd asked me, Pastor Jeff, you asked me, you said, Rabbi Jack, could you bring the shank bones for us? Because it would really help to, you know, be authentic at the Seder. I said, of course. And so, guys, I'm happy to be supplying all the shank bones for the Seder tonight. Um, but, but pray for me because, boy, I live in Phoenix, and boy, was it fun getting 22 shank bones through airport security. <laughs> that was great. It, it was wonderful. I was going on to TSA, and they ask me the same thing every year. Say, sir, would you mind telling us what you're doing with all these bones? <laughs> and my pat answer is, yes, my name is Ezekiel. I've had a vision. Leave me alone. <laughs> Gosh. So, you ready to do this, Seder? Let's find Jesus in places in the Scripture where he's always, always been because that's the whole idea tonight let us draw him closer to us in our hearts as we begin the seder what i want you to do everyone is we begin the seder by partaking of the first of our four cups of grape juice and so you could actually lift your cup right now as i said each cup goes by a different name this first cup is called the cup of sanctification or the cup of holiness. And here's why. Why did God redeem the Israelites out of slavery and bondage in the first place? Was it because they were just such a, such a wonderful, righteous, obedient, holy bunch of folks? Right, not even close. How many of you know God didn't bring the Israelites out of Egypt because they were holy? God redeemed the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt because he wanted them to be holy. How do we know this? It's in the Bible. Leviticus 19.2 is the verse that you want, where the Lord says, you be holy, for I am holy. And so this cup of grape juice is a reminder of that. It's also a reminder of something else, or, you know, actually someone else. See the color of the grape juice in here? We could have used white. This is intentional. It, the color of the grape juice is there to remind us of Christ's blood. What does the blood of Jesus have to do with our holiness? How about everything? You know, there is nothing that we have ever done or can ever do to achieve or attain holiness. The book of Isaiah tells us any righteousness we think we have, forget it. It's like filthy rags. The only reason we can claim any holiness at all is not because of anything we have ever done or will ever do. The reason we can claim any holiness at all is because of everything that Christ already did. And so in that regard, and only for the first cup, <clears throat> I'll recite, actually I'll sing the traditional blessing in Hebrew. I'll then translate it for us in the English, and then I'll show you how the English translation of a traditional Jewish blessing always pointed to Christ. So feel free to raise your cups, and the blessing is sung this way. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, borei peri hagafen, amen. And that means, blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, listen, who created the fruit of the vine. And here's what I like to add. And who reminds us, oh, in places like 1 Corinthians 15, it's in verse 20 and 23. It tells us that Jesus is our first fruits. And when you turn to the book of John chapter 15, it tells us, Jesus tells us that he's also the vine. We are the branches. And if we remain in him, we will bear much. There you go. Take a sip of your first cup. Praise the Lord. Now, since we're going to be 
distributing and engaging and partaking in food items in just a few minutes, it's customary as we continue the Seder for the second part of it that we have a ritual hand washing. And that's what your bowls are for and, and, and your pitchers. And by the way, while I'm talking, if you want, if I can have every, uh, one person at each table, take the towel out and I'll do it for ours and just pour the water from the pitcher, a little bit of it, into your bowl. We're going to do something a little bit differently tonight. Now, in this hand washing, um, by the way, uh, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background. Uh, I, I grew up in a, uh, in a Jewish home uh, in, in the Holy Land, everybody. Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> when, 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 I was, when I was growing up, I was about four or five, and we had our Passover Seder. And at that age, I, I started asking questions about the Seder. And I remember I asked my mom, I said, Mom, why do we put our hands in the bowl to wash? Because that's what you do with this hand washing. You'll put your hands in the bowl to wash and then use the towel traditionally to dry your hands. I said, Mom, why do we, we put our hands in the bowl to wash? And she gave me the, the traditional answer that every Jewish mother gives to their Jewish son when they ask the mother a question. She said, son, I don't know, go ask your father. So I did. And... Uh, <laughs> He said, the reason you put your hands in the bowl to wash is because you want to come humbly before the Lord. This is an act of humility before the Lord for the Seder service. And at a traditional Jewish Passover Seder, that's where the significance begins, and that's where it ends. For all of us, though, as believers, there's much, much greater significance in this, and let me explain why. We've already used the term Passover Seder several times. It's a new term for you, but what it describes is actually another term that you're very familiar with. Anybody ever hear of the Last Supper? My friends, Christ's Last Supper with his disciples was his Passover Seder. How do we know? We know because if you read the scriptures, it says earlier in the day, he told his disciples, go and find a place to prepare the Passover. And of course, it's something Italian that looked like that. <laughs> or not exactly. But you know what? I tell you what, I love Da Vinci's Last Supper. I'm glad you guys have it at the ready, but you know what? Bill and Jason, we're going to have this photo up again a little bit later in the Seder, and I'll cue you, but I'm glad that that's up here now so that you could see that, that there is something very, very authentic in an Italian table setting by Leonardo da Vinci who knew nothing about Judaism, but boy, did he give it a good shot. Amen? <laughs> so... This is a Passover Seder. And by the way, it looks a lot different than, than that. But at Jesus' Passover Seder, you know, in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, it tells us that, that Jesus did something with, with a hand towel and a basin of water. Right. Do you remember? He took that hand towel and proceeded to wash and dry the feet of his disciples. You want to talk humility. Think about this. This is the King of kings and Lord of lords. This is God manifest in the flesh come down from heaven to wash ordinary people's dirty feet. That is incredible humility and amazing love. Can you imagine how the disciples must have felt as they were looking down their legs and saw Jesus kneeling at their feet, taking a towel and lovingly dry, drying their feet for them and their legs. They were probably moved to tears, must have had a feeling inside that you probably cannot put into words of great love and warmth and appreciation. I believe that we can get very, very close to experiencing and feeling something very, very similar to what the disciples felt back then. And so because of that, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. I'm already starting to get looks of concern. <laughs> Keep your shoes on. That's not where we're going. But here's what we will do. When the bowl of clear water comes over to you, yes, I want you to place your hands in the bowl of clear water to wash. But after you take your hands out of that bowl, I don't want you to take that hand towel to dry your own hands. I want the person who is sitting to the right of you to take that hand towel and to lovingly dry your hands for you. After they do that, please move the bowl of clear water over to the right, over to them. They will then place their hands in the bowl, and the person to their right will then take the hand towel and lovingly dry their hands for them. You're going to do this until you've gone all the way around the table, and as this is being done for you, 
and you are doing this for others, many of you, I'm sure, because it happened last year, remember, will feel a feeling inside of just great warmth and love and gratitude. You won't be able to put into words, and it's okay. But not if, but when you feel that, you, I'm sure, will be feeling very, very much the same feeling that the disciples of Jesus felt when he did something similar to this for them some 2,000 years ago. Why don't you go and do that right now? Amen. I got you. I'll join you guys for this. All right. It's all right, Gretchen. Sit, relax tonight. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for Riley. Lord, I just ask that you would continue to bless him and anoint him. Let him know, Lord God, how much you love him. And we give you thanks for him. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you, brother. You're welcome. Oh, I got it. Hang on, Gretchen. I'm going to put this over here. And... Hallelujah. Thank you, sweetheart. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. Amen. Oh my gosh, this table is having so much fun. I think they're going around twice. <laughs> You're right over here. <laughs> oh, don't do that. doing over here all right praise the lord wow. bless you oh my gosh you guys are just about done aren't you okay good good praise the lord well, everybody, as, uh, as you're finishing up, and uh, hey, Bill, hey, Bill, could you guys turn the volume up just a little bit? Bill's looking for me on the stage. I'm over here. <sighs> so uh, I see that, uh, that most of you, uh, how many of you are, 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 still, um, are still washing or drying someone's hand? Okay. Uh, when you finish up, at your table, what we're going to do is we're actually going to start to distribute the first item from your Seder plate. So I'll ask everybody at the table. Actually, wait, I have a better idea. Rather than asking everybody at the table to go and take a piece of parsley from the Seder plate, you know, at a Passover Seder, each table is considered its own individual family. And so because of that, it's customary that at the Seder, each table designates one person in that family to act as the table leader, the one who will distribute the items and the elements to other folks. So in a, and it'll be quick, in a very orderly fashion, would you please choose someone at your table to be the table leader? Real orderly and organized. Go ahead and do that right now. And okay, stop. Oh my gosh. 
This is why the Bible says our God is a God of order, not confusion. All right, hang on. Let me break the tension here. There's a way to figure this out. So after I said, choose somebody at your table to be the table leader, after I said that, if you were sitting at the table and kind of like covering up your face, <laughs> hoping nobody would look at you and you would be invisible, and then when you took a peek through your fingers, you realized that everybody else at the table was already pointing at you. <laughs> there you go. Congratulations. You're the table leader. <laughs> so... Table leader, would you now distribute a sprig of parsley to everyone at your table? Go right ahead. There you go. Table leader is going to distribute a sprig of parsley. And this is interesting, by the way, because I see that some of our table leaders are sitting down, and the ones who have worked in restaurants are standing up. <laughs> So make sure you all get a sprig of parsley. And uh, by the way, guys, this next demonstration, I'm going to do from like this table because y'all are entirely too quiet. <laughs> all right? <laughs> so when you have that sprig of parsley and, you know, I would reach for a sprig. You use them all up. Oh, gosh. Oh, thank you. Wait a minute. There's this microscopic piece over here. <laughs> that You did a good job. So uh, when you have this sprig of parsley, let me show you. I'm right down here, but don't worry. You'll be able to figure out what I'm doing in a minute as I describe this to you. The Seder is done each year, and we use visual elements because we want to be reminded each year of the Passover story. And so in order to be reminded, we need to remember. We remember things best visually. So what you're going to do at your tables, not yet, but in a few minutes, is that small bowl of salt water that you have on your Seder plate, when it comes over to you, what you'll do is you'll take that sprig of parsley that you have, you will dip it into the salt water, don't do it yet, but you'll dip it into the salt water, get it really saturated, and then after you do, you'll take the parsley, you'll hold it over that cup or bowl of salt water, and you'll shake it until you see the salt water drops coming down. After you do that, the tradition is to then take a bite. Oh, gosh, that's so wrong. Anyway, <laughs> here's why we do that. And I don't want to double dip, so do we have another sprig of parsley? Guys, do you have a sprig of parsley at your table? <laughs> God is so good, it fell from heaven. Oh, Jody, I'm good now. That's great. Listen, after the Seder, when you go home and people say, how was the Seder? It's like, oh, you know, we had this rabbi here. They were throwing parsley at him. They couldn't wait for him to leave. <laughs> but here's the significance of it. You put the parsley in the bowl of salt water or the cup of salt water, hold it up, and that's where one place where you can find or see salt water drops. Where is another? Right, our tears. You do this because you want to have a visual reminder of the tears that the Israelite slaves shed when they were in bondage in Egypt. But the story gets better. Parsley is a plant. Plants grow in the springtime, and spring is a time of new life. Out of their tears, God gave them new life, taking away their tears and sorrows. And now the salt water is to be a reminder to us of the waters of the Sea of Reeds or the Red Sea that the Israelites crossed on their way out of sadness and slavery, on their way to happiness and redemption. And of course, that's their story, which means who else's story is it? You're catching on. As I said, we have a lot in common with those Israelites. Before we knew Jesus, we too were slaves to the devil, shedding tears of misery. But what happened? Christ came down from heaven, giving us new life, taking away our tears. And now the salt water, it's to be to us a picture or a reminder of the waters of baptism. Because when we're baptized, baptism is actually an outward sign of our inward obedience to identifying with Christ's death and burial and resurrection. And how many of you know that if even one of those things is not in the equation, none of us would be here right now? There's something else to tell you about the partially that's really important. You remember a little while ago, I went over to each doorway and I did the illustration of the people in Egypt who smeared the blood of the lamb on the lintel and the doorposts. When they did that, they didn't use their hands. 
they used a plant, a plant called hyssop. And so the parsley is there for you on the Seder plate as a reminder of the hyssop plant that was used to smear the blood in the prefigurement of a cross. You know what's really interesting? When you get to the New Testament, it speaks about hyssop again. And the first time it does, it tells us that Jesus, our lamb, was on the fulfillment of the lintel and the doorpost. They wanted to feed him vinegar to drink, and they used a sprig of hyssop to do it. It's all about him. So, once again, when the cup or the bowl of salt water comes over to you, take your sprig of parsley, dip it in, and then after you take it out, feel free to be bold and take a bite, and then you'll understand why restaurants don't serve parsley with anything anymore. There you go, everybody. Let the bowl go to each and every one of you. Dip that parsley in. Make sure you see the drops of salt water, too. Amen. It's okay. You can eat the stem. It's fiber. Don't worry. In fact, hang on. I'm going to give this table part of your parsley back that you were so kind enough to like throw to the other. Who threw that? Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Gwen, you have a pitching arm like nobody's business. My goodness. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> it is. It is. How are we doing here, guys? We're good? We're eating the parsley? Listen, there is one benefit to this. Just so you all know, one of the benefits of everybody taking a bite of the parsley is that this will ensure that everyone, you and everyone else at your table, have nice, fresh, clean breath for the rest of the night. No, it's good. Amen. All right. <laughs> good. How are we doing over here? We all had the parsley? Okay. All right. Now, once you've done that, once you've done that, everybody, let's see. I'm going to go back to, uh, where's my home table over here? I'm going to go back to my home table uh, over here, and uh, let's see. Uh, Stan, can you pass me that, please, That uh, the napkin with the slices of matzah in it? Great. Thank you so much. So what I want to do now is I want to talk about the matzah or the unleavened bread that you have on your Seder table. And uh, by the way, when you go to a Passover Seder at a traditional Jewish home, you will find that somewhere on the table they'll have a round plate and they'll probably have maybe 10, 15, 20 slices of this matzah or this unleavened bread. But always, always at a Passover Seder in a Jewish home, somewhere else on the table, the Jewish family will put exactly, exactly, specifically, three slices of unleavened bread. No more, no less. And if you ask the Jewish family, why do you put, can you tell me why you place three slices specifically of unleavened bread on the plate at the Passover Seder, they will look at you assuredly and say, we have no idea. <laughs> because many of them don't. They know that it's a tradition, but they don't know where it comes from. So let me tell you, a long time ago, the traditional rabbis said, let's add or have specifically three slices of unleavened bread somewhere on the Seder table as a reminder of the three great patriarchs of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I mean, sure, I see that triunity going on in these three slices of unleavened bread, but I think that maybe I see and probably you see an even better, greater triunity going on in these three slices of unleavened bread. Do you have an idea what I'm hinting at? Right, how about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, let me show you what is done now in a traditional Jewish home at their Passover Seder with one of these three slices of matzah or unleavened bread. When I show you what is done, you will pick up the significance of it in a second. But I will tell you, when Jewish people do this, the thought that automatically occurs to us doesn't even enter their mind. So I want you to watch closely. It's at this point in the Passover Seder that the head of the table 
Well, look at these three slices of unleavened bread. Remember, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God the Son being the middle piece. And they will take out of these three slices of unleavened bread the middle piece or the sun piece. They will then break it, and they will then proceed to wrap the broken piece in a white cloth. Can any of you possibly see where we might be going with this? Amen. And then, Pastor Jeff, it's that time of year again for you. Buddy, come on up. Because once we have this piece of unleavened bread broken from the sun piece and wrapped in a white cloth, it's customary for someone at the Seder to take this piece of unleavened bread, and Pastor, that's going to be you, and in accordance with the traditions of the Passover Seder, what I need you to do now with that piece of unleavened bread is I need you to go and hide it away somewhere or, oh, not on there. Hide it away somewhere in the facility or, oh, I don't know, why don't we just say bury it? Okay. All right? Okay. Not on your person, but you know. So because a little bit later, and this is why I'm so glad so many of you brought the kids Kids, there is a part of the Seder, two parts of the Seder, that you guys lead. I can't do it. The kids will actually lead it. And this will be one of those parts because after the dinner meal, what we're going to do is we're going to send the kids out to go out and hunt for that piece of unleavened bread and find it and bring it back. Or, oh, I don't know, why don't we just say resurrect that? You wouldn't have any idea where we're going with this at all, now would you? Now, obviously, this plays out the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We all see that. Jewish people who don't even believe in Jesus do this every single year, but that thought doesn't even enter their minds. So do you know why they do it? Let me tell you. Uh, when I became a, a believer, it was uh, in, in 1988, my wife, Sandy, uh, showed me the Old Testament messianic prophecies of a Messiah who would come. And by the way, Jesus fulfills them all. And uh, later that year, my mom and dad in New York, who were not saved, called me and they said, uh, they said, son, would you and Sandy come on up and be with us for our Passover Seder this coming year? And I said, oh yeah. <laughs> and when they got to the part of breaking the piece of unleavened bread and hiding it, I couldn't hold back because I was a believer then. They were still not believers. I said, Mom, Dad, don't you understand? You're playing out the death and burial and the resurrection of a Messiah that you don't even believe in. They said, that's not why we do it. I said, then why do you do it? Here's what they said. They said, well, son, we know that when Passover comes, that Passover usually comes at around the same time on the calendar as Easter does. And I said, uh-huh. And they said, and we know that during Passover, all the Christian kids get to go hunting for Easter eggs and marshmallow peeps and chocolate bunnies. And I said, uh-huh. And they said, well, we didn't want the Jewish kids to feel left out, so we wanted to give you something exciting to hunt for, too. Great. You guys got to look for candy. I had to go find cardboard. Thank you so much. Anyway, we're going to talk more about this piece of matzah in a little bit, but that's what that's all about. But in the meantime, as we continue and we go on with our Seder, here's what we're going to do next, everybody. What we're going to do next is I need the, let's see, uh, I need the four youngest kids in the room who are able to read. If you are a child and can read, or if you are an adult who wants to act like a child, get on up here. I need four of you. The four youngest kids in the room who are able to read, and guys, I'm looking for the microphone. Uh, Pastor, well, uh, Pastor, oh, is it up here? Oh my gosh, there it is. Thank you so much. I'm telling you guys to find a piece of matzah. I can't even find the microphone. So let me, we have, uh, let's see, come on up. I need one more. There you go. All right, Jonah, come on up here, buddy. Uh, go, by the way, give the kids a hand. Go ahead. This is really, really good. So... Guys and girl, let me tell you why you're up here. There's a part of the Passover Seder, as I said, that you guys lead. I can't do it. It's specifically for the kids. In Hebrew, it's called the Manishtana, which means asking the four questions. 
each one of you is going to ask a question from that book. It's on page 11, and I'll show you where that page is in a minute. So what I want you to do is open up the book, turn it to page 11. By the way, because it's kind of like a Hebrew-style book, it opens from the back of the book. That's the best way that I can describe it. So on page 11 in this book, and uh, you got it, sweetheart. On page 11, there are four questions to ask during the Seder. I'm going to have each one of these young people ask one of the questions, and as our Seder goes on, we'll start answering them. So, guys, here's what we're going to do. Uh, Jonah, I'll have you stand right over here. I will have you stand right over next to Jonah. I'll have you stand right over here. Excellent. And I'll have you stand right there, and we'll find out who we have up here. So I'll make sure our mic is on. And tell everyone your name. Abby. That is correct. Now, Abby. <laughs> So, Abby, here's what we're going to do. Abby, what I need you to do is I need you to read from this book question number one, which are these two lines. On all nights, we eat bread or matzah. On this night, why do we only eat matzah? Nice job, Abby. Thanks so much. Appreciate that. Stay right where you are. Okay. Hi, sweetheart. What's your name? Sarah Jade. All right. Sarah Jade. Wait, question. No, it's Sarah Jade. Oh, I am sorry. <laughs> Atta girl. <laughs> Listen, how old are you? Seven. I love the assertiveness at this young age, don't you? This is great. You are going to read question number two, which are these two lines right over here. You ready? Uh, okay. On all other nights, why do we eat all kinds of vegetables? On this night, why do we only eat bitter herbs? Oh my gosh, you're good. Thank you so much. Give her a hand. Wow. Wow. And what's your name? Dante. Dante. Question number three is yours. Those two lines. On all other nights, what we do dip, we do not dip our veggies even once on this night. Why do we dip twice? Nice job, Dante. Thanks a lot, buddy. Stay right here. And Jonah, you've got question number four, which are those two lines right over there. On all other nights, we eat our meals sitting or reclining. On this night, why do we only recline? Guys, great job. And girls, great job. And you know what? Awesome. We'll answer those questions as we go on. You know what? Keep those books. Those books are for all of you because you did such a good job. You can go sit back down now. Give them a hand. They were great. Wow. Awesome. Awesome job. So in a few minutes, we'll start answering some of the questions. But what we're going to do now in the order of our Passover Seder, it's time for us now to go on to the second of our four cups of grape juice. And you'll remember we said that each cup goes by a different name. Everybody remember the name of the first cup? Sanctification or holiness. The second cup goes by one of two names too. It's either called the cup of judgment or the cup of plagues. And it's a reminder that God brought down or poured out 10 plagues on the land of Egypt that led to the redemption of the Israelites from slavery and bondage. And let me see, whose table have I not gone over to yet and hung out with? Just raise your hands. Huh? Okay, love to visit a table this. Table 19, I'm coming over to you. There we go. Oh my gosh, you're so excited. It's like I called your bingo number. Thank you. That was awesome. All right. So what you're going to do, everybody, first of all, let me show you with this second cup, the cup of judgment or the cup of plagues, at a traditional Passover Seder, there's a, a tradition that Jewish people do to illustrate God pouring out or bringing out 10 plagues. We're going to do something different tonight, but I'll show you what the tradition is, just so you know. What Jewish people do to illustrate this is they take their pinky finger, they dip it into the cup, they get a drop of grape juice on their pinky, and then they take that and they dab it on the side of a plate or a napkin 10 times as a reminder of the 10 plagues that God brought down on the land of Egypt. Fine tradition, nice tradition. We're going to be doing a little bit of a different tradition tonight. And we know we have some folks who were with me last year, but for those of you who've never been to one of my Passover seders, you've probably never seen this tradition that we're about to do done anywhere else before for one very obvious reason. I made it up. But <laughs> when you see why and how beautifully symbolic and deep it is, you'll understand. What we're going to do is this. 
You see that bowl of clear water that we just washed our hands in a little while ago? It Technically, it serves no further purpose. We don't need it anymore. But in a moment, what we'll do is I will recite the names of each one of the 10 plagues in the order that they appear in the book of Exodus. Every time I say the name of one of those plagues, you'll repeat that word after me. And after you repeat the word, you'll pour a tiny drop of grape juice from your cup into the bowl of clear water. After we've done that 10 times, we'll take a look at our bowl, we'll see what it looks like, and why that visual is so extremely important to remember. So, let's do that right now. And table 19, as I said, I'll join you for this. So, as many as the table who would like, I'll mention the name of one of the plagues, and after I do, just pour a drop, drop of grape juice, there you go, into, all right, your, go, your bowl or your glass, as it were, of, uh, did somebody take away your bowl? Well, let me see, somebody threw a sprig of parsley before, and we got, can somebody throw a bowl filled up? No, never mind, it's not a good idea. I tried. So, everyone, here we go. We'll say the names of the plagues you repeated after me, and after you say each plague, remember, tiny drop of grape juice into your bowl of clear water. Are you ready to do this with me? Okay. Here's the first one. Everybody say blood, blood. Frogs. frogs, lice, lice. flies, flies. Cattle, cattle disease, boils, boils. boils. Hail. hail, locusts, locusts. Darkness. darkness, death of the firstborn. All right, there you go. Thank you, everyone. So what did we do here? What we did was we wanted to show, obviously, how God brought down or poured out 10 plagues on the land of Egypt that led to the redemption of the Israelites. Oh, my gosh. Are you guys throwing frogs into the, into the thing of grape juice? <laughs> wait a minute. This is for the kids. And like, wait, who's the youngest person at the table here? Wait, yes. How old are you? 32, and you guys have already opened up the kitty bag. I can't stand it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, don't worry. We'll let you know. In fact, it could have been at that time. If you're under the age of 32, that is. No, it's all right. So let's see what we just did. We wanted to show how God brought down or poured out 10 plagues on the land of Egypt that led to the Israelites from slavery and bondage. And so we, we poured the grape juice into the bowl of clear water to illustrate this. But again, here's a reminder. Remember I said earlier that this cup is to be to us a picture or a reminder of Christ's blood poured out for us that led to our redemption from sin and slavery. But why did I want us to pour something indicative of Jesus' blood into the bowl of clear water? It's because I believe one of the best ways of learning Scripture is by being able to see Scripture. And if you take a look in your bowls right now, you see something very, very interesting. Indeed. In fact, you see a Bible verse in there. Let me give it to you. John, chapter 19, verse 34. Do you remember what that Bible verse says? It says, everybody, that as Jesus, our Lamb, was on the cross... In order to ensure that he was dead, do you remember what happened? Right. A Roman soldier came over, pierced his side, and out came blood and water. And when the two liquids dropped down the side of his body and came together right there at the foot of the cross, they probably would have combined to form the color very, very similar to what you have in your bowls right now. A powerful, powerful reminder. Look at what he was willing to go through for each and every one in here and the whole world. How he was willing to suffer so that our sins could be cleansed and we could have the promise of spending eternal life. What a beautiful, loving God we serve. Look what he did for us. Amen? Praise the Lord. Well, as our Seder goes on right now, Here's what we're going to do. I want to speak with you or tell you a little bit about the hard-boiled or roasted egg that you have on your Seder plate. And by the way, you can eat this at the end of the Seder, just not now. 
Um, we know that at Jesus' Passover Seder Last Supper, we know what was on the menu. It was really three things. Jesus and the disciples ate lamb. They ate unleavened bread, and I'll tell you why in a few minutes. And they ate bitter herbs. So how many of you know that there was no hard-boiled or roasted egg at Jesus' Last Supper? So if he didn't have it on his table, why do we have it on ours? And it's a great question, and here's the answer for you. After the second temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, the traditional rabbis of the day decided to add an egg to the Seder plate as a reminder of the peace offerings and sacrifices that the people would bring to the temple when they came up to the temple in Jerusalem three times a year in ancient Israel. One of those times was Passover, and guess what? Jesus and his family did it too. The story is found in Luke chapter 2, and many of you have read the story. Jesus and his family, you know, uh, his father and mother, they went up to the temple during Passover. And you know how the story goes. It says at the end of the festival, Joseph and Mary are walking home, and at one point, they look at each other and they utter those famous words forever etched in Scripture, which were, No, I thought you had him. I don't know where he is either. <laughs> And of course, they went back to the temple looking for Jesus, and, and you have a, a typical Jewish conversation because a, a question is asked, and in Judaism, we always answer a question with a question. Jesus' parents asked, where were you? Didn't you know? Didn't you know that we were worried about you? And he said, didn't you know I was about my father's business? Everybody asks a question. Nobody ever answers. That's how we go through life. Anyway. When you went to the temple at that time, you brought up what were called sacrifices or peace offerings. The rabbi said, let's make this a peace offering. And when they added this, they weren't trying to point to Jesus, but they ended up doing so anyway in a couple of ways. Let's think about this. The words peace offering. Let's take that first word, peace. That's one of his titles. It's one of his names. He's our prince of peace. How about the word offering? Well, is he not the greatest offering that could have ever been received from heaven above? And I'll tell you why else I like the egg. It's, I mean, it's close. It's not exact, but it's really close because you can define the Trinity, but it's really, really tough to explain. But uh, how many eggs am I holding in my hand? One. Everybody's there. There is no doubt. Now, on the outside of this egg, I have a shell, and I could take the shell off, and the shell is one essence of this one egg, yeah? And under the shell, I have the white, and I could take the white off, and the white would uh, obviously be called a second essence of this still one egg, right? And after I take the shell and the white off, I, I'm, I have still left the yolk, and the yolk would be a third essence of this still one egg. And the reason I wanted to share that with you is because I've often met folks, and Pastor, I'm sure you too, will really have a tough time trying to grasp the idea of the Trinity and, and really try to negotiate and say, well, wait a minute. How can you say that you can have God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, which sounds like three gods, and then after that say that that all is about one God? I don't understand how God can do it. Oh my gosh, think about it. It's so easy. An egg can do it. So I think the one who created the egg can probably do that too, don't you? Keep that in mind next time. Well, here's what I need you to do now, everybody. That piece of matzah that I said tastes good with something on it. In a minute, we're going to put something on it. But first, table leaders, would you distribute to each and every one at your table a piece of the matzah or unleavened bread? And remember, in a separate napkin, if you need gluten-free, you've got gluten-free in there. So table leaders, make sure everyone at your table gets a piece of matzah. I'll put some more over here. There we go. Piece of matzah for everyone at your table. There we go. Piece of matzah over there. Great. Everybody's getting a piece of matzah over here. All righty. Let's see. How are we doing over here? We're going to get a piece of matzah. Okay. Hey, Brother Jeff. I just want to see how they're doing with the matzah. Oh, you got it. There we go. Everybody getting a piece of matzah. Okay. Yep. Now, don't eat the matzah yet. Just make sure that everybody gets a piece of matzah. Okay. 
There we go. We got it. Wait a minute. Hold on. Time out. Oh my gosh. Wait, hold on. I'm going to scoot through here for just a minute. I have to wait. Hold on. I have to find something out, everybody. Wait a minute. Why are your piece of matzah so small? Why are we war rationing matzah at table 12? <laughs> are you kidding? Hang on, guys. I'm trying to do my best. I know you are. <laughs> I tell you what, I'm going to help you out. I'm bringing some matzah from the neighboring table over to you guys. Feed them. Give them more matzah. They're starving to death at 740. Oh, my gosh. Hold on. Oh, thank God we've got more matzah here. Thank you. It's being donated toward a good cause. These people need to eat. One second. Hold on. Table number 12. Here's some more matzah for you. Oh, wow. And this is what charity is all about, everybody. So here's what I need you to do. What I need you to do is I want you, you, you have this matzah in your hands, and I'm going to take a piece of matzah here. Don't worry, I'm giving it back because you folks need it. Anyway, <laughs> the matzah, the unleavened bread, why is it on the table in the first place? And, and Abby, where are you? Abby, you asked the first question, and thank you for doing that, because Abby, the first question was, on all other nights we eat bread or matzah, unleavened bread. But on the nights of Passover, why only matzah? And Abby, thank you. It's a great question. We'll answer it for you now. Here's the answer. First of all, you need to know that when the Israelites were, were finally released from slavery and bondage in Egypt, they didn't just walk out of Egypt. They ran for their very lives out of Egypt because they knew that at a moment's notice, Yul Brynner was sending his troops... <laughs> Come on. And so, at one point they said, look, we've been running, we've been running, we can't run anymore, we need to rest, and we're hungry. That's why I gave you guys more. Okay, anyway. So they sat down to eat, and they decided to bake the bread. But the problem is, they didn't have enough time to sit in camp because the Egyptian army was in pursuit, so that didn't allow enough time for the dough and the bread to rise. So because of that, the bread baked flat. That's why we eat this type of bread during Passover. It's a reminder of the bread of affliction that the Israelites ate when they were free, fleeing Egypt and wandering away. That's one story, and there's a lot of truth to that, but we think that there's another story. Here's how we know. Let me ask all of you a question. How many of you in here love to bake? Raise your hands. Okay, so you know, you know that when you bake, I mean, it, it has to do with a little bit more than time because you can have all the time in the world to bake something, but if you don't add yeast into the recipe, it's never going to rise, correct? We believe that that may have played into the equation as well, that perhaps the reason that the, bread, that the dough and the bread didn't rise was that the Israelites didn't have yeast with them. We think that that would be the case. Logically, consider this. One night, they get a knock on their door. The Israelite slaves have been waiting for close to 200 years to get out of Egypt. Somebody knocks on the door and says, our time of liberation and redemption has come. Get out for your lives. Run for your lives right now. And they all ran for their lives as fast as they could. Do you think any of them said, wait a minute, where's the yeast? Let's go find that for... No, so they probably didn't have yeast with them, and that's why the bread baked flat. This bread is, that you're holding in your hands is mentioned in the Bible. You're holding biblical food. And it's not only mentioned in the book of Exodus where you'd expect, but it's also mentioned in the New Testament. And you know who talks about it? Anybody want to take a guess? Jesus is a great, great guess. It's wrong, though, but it's a great guess. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. You know what? That's also a great guess. And God spoke through someone. Whew, I got out of that one good. She's a girl. I have to be nice here. Yes, Jonah. You got it. Paul, the apostle Paul spoke about this. Let me give you the address. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. Listen to Paul's words in here. It's a Passover reference. Paul says, don't you know that even adding a little bit of yeast into the recipe will ruin the whole loaf. He said, so don't be like bread with yeast that puffs itself up or puffs itself up. 
Instead, be like this kind of bread. Bread without yeast. Bread that doesn't puff itself up like Christ's star Passover was. Let me unpack this for you. How many of you know when Paul was saying don't be like bread with yeast, he wasn't referring to literal bread anymore? He was referring... What? What does it mean? Wait, come on up here. I want them to hear you. This is going to be good. Come on up. No, come on up. I said kids lead a part of the Seder. We've just invented another part. Wait, wait, hold on, hold on, wait. I just want to make sure that our microphone is on, okay? And hold on because this is a big event. We're calling Channel 7 News to come in right... No, I'm only kidding. What's your name? Kevin, and the yeast of the bread means we're puffing up with pride. And this bread means... We're not with pride, but we're with the glory of God. I love him. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. I've hey. known it for a while. What? I've known it for a while. Apparently, you have. <laughs> hey, Kevin, I got a question for you. Saturday night, I'm doing one of these at Discovery Fellowship Church in Fort Collins. Would you come with me? No. Thanks for coming up here. <laughs> Give me, he said no. Give him a hand. Wow. This is cool. Pastor Jeff, can I still come back next year? Or you're going to have the kids lead the whole thing. No, he's great. Kevin, excellent, excellent explanation. And you're right, buddy. This bread is a reminder of Jesus. The yeast represents sin. Pride is sin. So since this is bread without yeast, it's a picture of bread without sin, like Christ, our Passover. How is Jesus our bread without sin? Well, first of all, one of his names is the bread of life. Also, what town was Jesus born in, everybody? Bethlehem. At least that's the name of the town in English. But in Hebrew, it's not one word, Bethlehem, it's two. Beit Lechem. The Hebrew word bait means the house of, and the word lechem means bread. So our bread of life was born in the house of bread. And why is he our sinless bread? Because he committed no sin. It's all about him. As you're holding this bread, I want to show you some other portraits or images of Christ in here. Look at the darker side of the bread. And you'll see that on the one hand, it resembles almost dark brown and white splotches or patches or even stripes that's a reminder of christ come as our suffering servant messiah as found in isaiah chapter 53 verse 5 he was pierced for our transgressions bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace is upon him by his stripes we are healed here's what i want you to do now take that piece of unleavened bread that you have and crack it and when you crack that piece of unleavened bread, you'll see that something or things came out of it. What were they? Crumbs. Why? Because the bread is very, very dry. A reminder of Jesus' condition on the cross in a prophecy of the crucifixion found in Psalm 22. My tongue cleaves to my mouth. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. And here's my favorite illustration of how the matzah points to Jesus. You really can't see it too well looking down at it at your table. You can't even see it at all. But you know what I want you to do now? Take a piece of unleavened bread, hold it above you under one of the bright lights, and all of a sudden, you didn't see them before, but now you see them line after line, lines of them. What do you see in this? Holes. A reminder of the holes or the piercings in Jesus' body. And you know what's so profound? You really can't fully appreciate, affirm, or acknowledge his holes or his piercings unless you are in the light. Amen? Well, here's what I want you to do now, everybody. Actually, I might do this for you first, because what we're going to do in a moment is you're going to take your piece of unleavened bread, and you're going to dip it into your cup of horseradish. And because I love you, and because this year so far, I think I've already done like 32, 33 satyrs, and because of that, my taste buds are gone anyway now. What I'm going to do is, uh, is, is I'll do this first. I'll taste this, test this. I have no idea how spicy it is. But what you'll do in a minute is, is when this uh, cup of, of uh, bitter herbs comes over to you, you'll take your piece of unleavened bread, you'll dip it in, and put a tiny bit 
of horseradish on your piece of <laughs> masa. Oh, that's entirely too much. Okay. And trust me on this. When you do that, before you take a bite, you pray. <laughs> All right, hang on. Let me see what we got here. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I need my water. Mm. Wow. Woo. All right. Let me put it to you this way. My sinuses haven't been this clear <laughs> since George Bush Sr. was president. <laughs> My goodness. Okay. <laughs> take, take your piece of matzo. <laughs> dip it into the horseradish. Then take a bite, and then I'll tell you why you've done such an abusive thing. <laughs> My word. Wow. Oh. Mm-mm-mm. Oh boy. So you're going to have one of two reactions. You're, you're all going to have one of two reactions. Let me tell you what those reactions are. Some of you will say, oh my gosh, that's way too bitter. Others will say, wow, that's great. Where's the prime rib? <laughs> Ma'am. Oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> Wait a minute. It's Kevin, right? Yeah. Kevin, you ate the horseradish? No, it's just like I didn't touch it lightly and ate it. Oh my gosh. Wow. Whoa. Oh boy. That's got quite a kick to it, doesn't it? So let me explain why you did this to yourselves. <laughs> you okay over there? So here's why we did this. Here's the explanation, everybody. The horseradish is very, very bitter. A reminder of the bitterness of slavery that the Israelites went through. And the reminder for us of how bitter it is to be a slave to sin, to the enemy. But there's something else about the horseradish. And I want to make sure you hear this because a lot of people don't know. Um, there's a part of uh, Christ's Last Supper, Passover, Seder story where what we just did is actually alluded to. But it's under the surface of the verses. So let me tell you where you can find it. So the part of Christ's Passover, Seder, Last Supper where Jesus and the disciples are sitting down and they're eating their meal, and everybody's just, you know, carrying on, enjoying the food, having a conversation. And then Christ says something that turns the whole atmosphere on its head. As all of his disciples are there just eating, he looks at them and he says, oh, by the way, I just want to let you know, tonight, one of you is going to betray me. Bon appetit. So, at that point, what the disciples say to him in response, do you remember they all asked him, Master, Rabbi, Teacher, is it I, is it I, is it I, is it I? Do you remember? Do you remember what his answer was to them? He said, I tell you this, it is the one who dips into the bowl. At that moment, Christ was referring to Judas Iscariot. As Judas Iscariot was taking a piece of unleavened bread and dipping it into the bitter herbs, just like we did here. Well, now that you've done that and survived, you see that uh, uh, charoset or charosis that you have on your tables? Remember, the one on the Seder plate has nuts, the one to the side doesn't. I want you to put a truckload of that on a piece of matzo right now and take a bite out of that and see how that tastes. I think you might like that a little bit better. <laughs> They, they, you, you had way too much horseradish? Oh, my gosh. I was just so moved to your message. That's what the tears are. Oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> wow. Let's see. I will try some of this. There we go. <laughs> oh, boy. Mm. Wow. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Oh, my goodness. Isn't that better? So, here's what we did, everybody. This harosis or charoset 
It's very, very sweet. Out of the bitterness of slavery for the Israelites came the sweetness of their redemption. Out of the bitterness of being a slave to the enemy comes the sweetness of our redemption in Christ. But there's something else to tell you about the charoset or charosis. It's very, very chunky, but it's also very, very gooey. The consistency of it is intentional. The consistency of it is supposed to be a reminder to us of the mortar in which the Israelite slaves worked in with their feet to make the bricks, to build the palaces for the Pharaoh of Egypt. Everybody got it? Are you all ready to eat real food? All right, here's what we're going to do. Our meal is about to be served, but right before we have our meal, it's customary for everybody at the Seder to sing a song and then our meal is served but the way that it works the rules of the seder are everyone has to sing every single word of this song in the actual hebrew or nobody's eaten but the good news is it's just one hebrew word at least your part is one hebrew word that you keep saying over and over and over again and this word is pronounced dayenu everybody say dayenu that was great would you like to know what you just said okay Dianu means enough, and here's the context of it. It's not, I've had enough of that horseradish. It is, it's this context. If all God had done for the Israelites, which would have brought them out of slavery and bondage in Egypt, that alone would have been enough, but he did so much more for them. Brought them to Mount Sinai, showed them all the commandments they needed to observe, so they'd realize that you can't observe commandments to get into heaven. The only way is acknowledging the shed blood of Christ. If all God had done for us were to have sent Jesus to us to cleanse us of our sins, that alone would have been enough. But he did so much more for us. Not only does he cleanse us of our sins, but he gives us the promise of spending eternity with him. So we sing, Dianu, very, very easy song. Your part is, I'll start the tune. You'll catch on in about a second and a half and just join in with me. It goes like this. Die, die, ye new. Die, die, ye new. Die, die, ye new. Die, ye new. Die, ye new. One more time. Die, die, ye new. Die, die, ye new. Die, die, ye new. Die, ye new. Die, ye new. You did it. Give yourselves a hand. You're amazing. Now, our meal, the real food, is about to be served. And so you'll take the opportunity, enjoy your meal. At the end of the meal, the end of the meal is not the end of the Seder. We're about two-thirds of the way through. The reason it's not the end of the Seder is let's keep a couple of things in mind. We have four cups. We've only gone through the first two, so there are two more to go. I haven't talked about the lamb shank bone yet. Also, also, somewhere out there is a piece of unleavened bread that the kids will need to find. And sometime before the end of the Seder, we need to invite a special guest to come on in and join us. So take this opportunity now. Enjoy your meal and enjoy the fellowship. And let's give God all the praise because we're having a great time and we know it. You know, for many, when we think of Christ's Last Supper, Passover, Seder, um, this is the rendition that, that we were originally introduced to. And while you're reading, let me just tell you that Leonardo da Vinci had really good intentions, but that there are at least six errors in Leonardo da Vinci's portrait of the Last Supper between what he painted and what actually occurred and what happened at Christ's Passover Seder Last Supper. So let me tell you what they are. Uh, first, you will see that in front of Jesus and his disciples, there's this really, really long rectangular table. Everybody see it? Guess what? Remember when the kids were up here asking the four questions? And one of the questions was, on all other nights, we eat sitting or reclining. But on this night, why do we only recline? You need to know that at Jesus' Passover Seder, they didn't have a table at all. And if they did have a table, it wouldn't have looked like that. It would have been in the shape of a letter U so that everybody at the table could see everyone else while they were sitting. They were actually reclining, leaning to the left, propped up on pillows or cushions while they were eating. Why would they do that? Why would they eat that way? Well, the reason was, was because, again, the first Passover meal, 
The Israelites ate in haste when they were on the run. But since they're no longer slaves, they could eat and relax. They don't have to run anymore. So, no table, number one. And number two, you'll see on Da Vinci's Portrait of the Last Supper, pretty much everybody is sitting and nobody's really reclining on tables or, or pillows, as it were. So that's number two. Number three, we know that at Christ's Last Supper Passover Seder, as we already explained, Jesus and the disciples were eating unleavened bread. If you look closely, Da Vinci apparently didn't get the menu. Because he's painted in for each and every one of the disciples. It looks like he's given each one of them their own Pillsbury Flake dinner roll. Let's see, that's number three. Uh, number four, I don't know if you've ever noticed what's on their plates. We know that at Christ's Last Supper Passover Seder, Jesus and his disciples ate lamb. But if you look very, very closely on the plates, Da Vinci has painted in fish. Why? That would have been the holy meal if this took place in Rome or Florence or Naples, but it didn't. The Passover Seder Last Supper took place in Israel. Let's see. One other thing to tell you about. See these beautiful garments that Jesus and the disciples are all wearing? That was the fashion of the day in Milan, Italy. But the Passover Seder took place, of course, in Jerusalem and Israel, and the garments would have been entirely different. They weren't wearing anything even remotely close to that. That's number five. And finally, last but not least, number six. When you look beyond Jesus and the disciples, look beyond at the windows in the back of the room. And when you look out the windows, you could see, sure looks like a nice, bright, sunny day. And that's a nice scene. There's only one problem with it. Impossible. Because since the biblical day in Israel began at sundown, and you couldn't sit down or even eat the Passover Seder until after the sun had already set, it couldn't possibly still be a bright sunny day outside those windows as Jesus and his disciples are partaking of their Passover. And now you no. So now that we've got that down, and uh, by the way, adults continue to keep on eating, but uh, let's see, being a parent with three kids, I know the kids have a tendency to finish or at least stop eating before the grown-ups do, which means we've got to give the kids something to do, and we're going to do that right now. And so for the kids and for the adults, you might be reminded here that uh, a little while ago, and I'll put this second mic back down so I can switch back to this other one, provided I turn the switch on, everybody, so hang on just a sec. You may remember a, a little while ago, we had a, a piece of unleavened bread broken from the sun, wrapped in a white cloth, and uh, uh, Pastor, you remember I gave you that piece of unleavened bread to go and hide it or bury it away somewhere. Uh, Brother Jeff, you, you remember doing that. I know it was a long time ago. It kind of looks, it seems almost like you did that three days and three nights ago, didn't it? And so now it's time for the kids to go and find that piece of matzah and bring it back. So kids, here's what we're going to do. I love it. Kevin is already up and running. <laughs> here's what we're going to do, everybody. Adults, we're going to count to three. And when we get to three, kids, I want you to go and hunt after that piece of unleavened bread and bring it back as fast as you can. So adults, count with me to three. Here we go. One, two, three. Kids, go find that piece of matzo. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Whoa. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, you, you know who all, do you know who also ran out the room? Pastor did, and he hid the thing. My gosh. So, all right, the kids are already running around outside. Whoa. There we go. I've never seen kids run out of church that quick. So we'll, uh, we'll give them a, a minute or two or three to, uh, to find that piece of, of unleavened bread. You know, uh, when we did this last year, because if I'm not mistaken, we did this last year, and oh my gosh, it has been found already? Come on over here. Wow. Come on over here. I, I, I have to find this out. 
This is, guys, this is it. We have a record here at Calvary Chapel of Grand Junction, Colorado. This is now the fastest record time that this piece of matzah has been found. And oh, by the way, before we deal with this, you, you, you know, this, this piece of unleavened bread, uh, it has a special name for it. It's a Greek word called afikomen. And we've been seeing how this has so many parallels to Jesus. You know what the word afikomen means? I am come. All about him. But I can't believe you found it this quickly. What's your name? Bailey. Bailey, thank you. I have to know. Bailey, my gosh, you had some stiff competition there. How were you able to find this thing? Um, I just looked and then I, find, I found it. She just looked and she found it. What a revelation. <laughs> now, Bailey, can I have that piece of unleavened bread? Thank you for giving that to me, but don't go anywhere. I actually need to give it back to you, and I need you to hold on to it for a second. Because, Bailey, according to the tradition of the Passover Seder, I can't acquire that piece of unleavened bread from you unless I give you something first, like um, cash money. Oh, her eyes got real big. <laughs> so, uh, Bailey, hang on. Let me see what I got here. Yeah, I got a couple of bucks. So, um, Bailey, so that's yours. And now I'll take the piece of matzah. You're welcome, sweetheart. Thank you so much. Give her a hand. She was great. She was great. The look, oh my gosh, the look on Bailey's face was so precious. If I could put it into words, it's like, wow, I went to church and they paid me. <laughs> that was awesome. So let's see what we've got, everybody. Just a reminder, we had this piece of unleavened bread broken from the sun piece, wrapped in a white cloth, buried away, but just for a little while, brought back or resurrected. And as a result of that resurrection, a redemption has taken place. Our redemption. Which brings us now, by the way, and you can keep on eating, to the third of your four cups of grape juice. And you can raise that cup now. Our third cup is called the cup of redemption. And let me give you the Old Testament significance and the New Testament fulfillment. The Old Testament significance is found in Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. And this is where the Lord said to Moses, he said, Moses, tell the Israelites, I will redeem you with a mighty hand and by my outstretched arm. Anytime you read the Bible, and you see a term that either says the arm of the Lord or the arm of God. That's another title for Messiah, for Christ. So what God was really saying there is, I will redeem the Israelites with a mighty hand, but I will redeem the whole world with my Jesus. And how does Jesus redeem us? By his blood. This cup, the cup of redemption, is a reminder of his blood that was shed for us. And that's very, very interesting because that reminds us of something else. Let me tell you. You remember at the beginning of tonight when we started off, I, I said, for how many of you is this your first ever Passover Seder? One of the reasons that I ask that is to find out how many of you have never been to one of these before. But in actuality, even you first timers, you may have participated in part of a Passover Seder before without even knowing it. Because, my friends, whenever you have partaken in communion, you've partaken in the third cup of Christ's Last Supper Passover Seder. This cup, a reminder of his blood that was shed for us. And because of that, we're not simply going to take this cup and take a sip and put it back down. It's too reverent, it's too holy, it's too important for that. And Paul said, don't do it that way either. It's in 1 Corinthians 11. When Paul was talking to the congregation at Corinth, he was dealing with a situation where people would partake of the Last Supper and just go through the motions. They didn't even care. They made it ordinary, commonplace, as if they were simply just going through a ritual. And Paul essentially said, look, if that's how you're going to go at this, it's better not to do it at all. And of course, Jesus also said, in reminder to this, he said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. People ask, how often is often? It's not it. That's not the question because it's not about frequency. 
it's always been about focus. That being the case, before we partake of this cup, I'll ask all of us just to take a moment in silence with the Lord. We want to come to the Lord the right way with the right heart and the right spirit and the Lord attitude and ask Him to, to just help us. Ask Him to cleanse us from any and all unrighteousness, things we may have done lately that we wish we could do over and do in a different way. And listen, this is not about guilt. We're no better or worse than the Apostle Paul. Because in the book of Romans, here's what Paul essentially said. He said, you know, I do things that I know I shouldn't be doing. And I don't do things that I know that I should. Let's ask the Lord for a moment in silence here just to cleanse us of those things that we shouldn't be doing and, and just ask him in our hearts to help us walk down a greater path of holiness. We'll do that with him for a moment in silence and then, and then we'll partake of this cup. Let's take a moment now. Lord Jesus, you tell us in your word that apart from you, we can't do anything. You remind us that you, you are the vine, we are the branches. If we remain in you, we will bear much fruit. And so, Lord Jesus, we all desire to walk a greater path of holiness within you, but we can't do it in and of ourselves the Apostle Paul tried it. He admit he failed, and so many others in Scripture. And Lord, we're just like them. And so, Lord, for what we can't do ourselves and for the place that we want to go with you, we ask for your help. We ask, Lord God, that you would just walk beside us and help us along this path that we desire to walk through. We thank you for that in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Now we can take a sip of our cups. Praise the Lord. Well, at this point in our Seder, and by the way, we're just, you know, um, uh, most of it's, we're pretty close to done. But at this part of the Seder, I need a volunteer. So I'm looking for the first hand up. Oh my gosh, I got you. Jonah, come on up, buddy. Come on up. I, I, Jonah, I saw your hand first. Come on up. Give Jonah a hand. He's coming up. Come on, buddy. Jonah. Thank you, by the way. This is why I love kids, because you could ask them to volunteer, and they're like, yes, without even knowing what they're volunteering for. Uh, this doesn't sound good. Well, Jonah, let me ask you a question. So, so um, y you like horseradish? No, no, it's okay. I'm not going to do that to you. Jonah, here's what I need you to do, buddy. Uh, you see that exit door right over there? Yeah. Okay. What I want you to do, Pastor, does that door open? Can we open that door? Yeah. Okay. That's kind of a, well, maybe, but Jonah, what I want you to do, I want you to go over to that exit door, open up the door, hold it open for about five seconds, then let it close, then go back to your seat. That's it. All right. Simple enough. So Jonah is going over to the door. He'll open the door. We'll count to five. And yep. Open that door. One, two, three, four. Five. All right, Jonah, close the door. There you go. Give him a hand. He's amazing. There you go. Jonah, thank you so much for doing that. By the way, Jonah, do you have any idea why I asked you to open up the door? Whoa. Uh-huh. For those of you who didn't hear, thank you so much. Spot on. Let me explain. You know, sometimes the simplest things can have the greatest meaning. This is one of them. Jonah just did for us one of the most important parts of the entire night. There is a tradition at when you go to Passover Seder's a Jewish home. If the host or hostess says they're having 20 people show up and you go over to the table and you see that they've set up for 21, they didn't make a mistake, they didn't fail math, it's intentional. At the Passover Seder at a traditional Jewish home, they always set one additional place setting for a special guest to come in. And in fact, the way that you allow that special guest to come in is that you open up 
the door. And Jonah, you hit it spot on. Each and every year, Jewish people open up the door to invite a special guest to come in. They're inviting the spirit of Elijah the prophet to join them at the Passover Seder because they believe that perhaps one year, They'll open up the door, and the real, true prophet Elijah himself will come, and he will herald or announce the coming of the Messiah. Interesting symbolism there. And and you know what? It actually has a tie-in for us, too, because uh, doesn't the Bible tell us that John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah? And come to think of it, didn't John the Baptist herald or announce the coming of the Messiah when in John 1 29 he said behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world which brings us to the last and final item or element on our Seder plate the lamb shank bone and you know I love talking about every part of it but I love talking about this one the most because the teaching is so so deep uh, let me tell you why we have this on our Seder plate and I think by now most of you know The lamb shank bone to us is a reminder, as I said, of the blood of the lamb that was slain, the blood smeared in the lintel and the doorposts, prefigurement of the cross, the blood covering our sins, and a reminder of Jesus, our lamb of God, who shed his blood on the fulfillment of the lintel and the doorpost, and his blood covers and takes away our sins. And there's the parallel for you. But the story doesn't end there. There's a greater story and a deeper story that, you know, many satyrs that I've been to, I've never heard them tell it, but it's an important part of the story. Little known, but I'll tell you. After the Israelites were released from slavery and bondage in Egypt, and this is recorded in Exodus 12 through 14, God said, Moses, I want the children of Israel to observe this festival for every year from now on, in Hebrew, the door of Ador, from generation to generation. So God gave specific instructions for the Israelites on how to celebrate this in the future. Listen to what God said. He said, Moses, every year when Passover comes, four days before that Passover, I want you to tell the head of every Israelite household to go out among their fields and flocks and take hold of a male lamb that has no spots or scratches or marks or scabs or blemishes on it. Tell the head of every household when they find such a lamb, they are then to take that lamb and bring that lamb into the family's house. Because for the next four days, that would give the family the opportunity to look over that lamb and examine that lamb and inspect and investigate that lamb to make sure that that lamb would be the lamb fit for sacrifice. Here's where the story goes to a a whole nother level. At the end of the four-day period on what was now known as the morning of the day of preparation, everyone who had a lamb in their house would bring their lambs outside of the house to a main area in the town. At that point, the high priest would then come and lead the procession of those lambs through the streets to the place where those lambs were to be sacrificed. The sacrificing of the lambs on that day began at approximately the third hour or nine o'clock in the morning. The sacrificial ritual, then we're told, went on for the next six hours and therefore concluded at the ninth hour or twilight or three o'clock in the afternoon. And oh, by the way, when the sacrificial ritual of the lambs was done, the high priest would make an official announcement letting everyone know. And we're told, it's on good record, that All the high priest would have to say to end it would be to say these three words. It is finished. Now, if Jesus is indeed our Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, then I would submit to you that every single thing that that physical Lamb went through, that in one way, shape, or form, or another, Jesus, our Lamb, would have had to have also have gone through, and not just that around the same time, but right down to the same hour and minute and second. And the question is, did he? And the answer is, oh, yes. So let me take that story again, but this time I'll show you how Christ fits into each and every parallel. 
We've said that four days before the Passover, the lamb went into the house. The Bible records that four days before Christ's Passover, do you know what Jesus, our lamb, did? Went into the house. The house of God, the house of prayer, the temple to cast out the money changers. So, the lamb goes into the house, and Jesus, the lamb, goes into the house, and in both cases, it's exactly four days before the Passover. Are you following me so far? Okay. For the next four days, the physical lamb is examined, inspected, and investigated to make sure that it would be the lamb fit for sacrifice. Do you know what Jesus, our lamb, was going through during that exact same four-day period? <clears throat> you don't have to wonder. It's in Scripture. Read Luke 20 through 22. First, a group of people <clears throat> came over to Jesus, and they said, Jesus, we're here in the streets, and we're noticing you're out here in the streets preaching the word of God. Who gave you the authority to go and preach these things? What were they doing to Jesus, our lamb, investigating him, examining him, inspecting him during the same four-day period that the physical lambs are going through the exact same thing? Then a second group came over to Jesus. Some of them were his own disciples. <clears throat> and they said, Jesus, we have these coins that have Caesar's bust or profile on them. Why do you say we should render to Caesar? What is Caesar's? What were they doing? Examining him, investigating him, inspecting him during the same four-day period that the physical lambs are going through the same thing. <clears throat> and then during that same four-day period, there was a third group that came over to Jesus, and they were known as the Sadducees. And Boy, they asked one of the weirdest questions you've ever heard asked in Scripture. They said, Jesus, let's say a man is the oldest of his seven Jewish brothers. Now, he marries a woman, but then he dies. So Jesus, according to Jewish law, when that happens, the next oldest brother marries the woman, and he does, but then he dies. So the next oldest brother has to marry her, and he does, and he dies, and the next oldest marries her, and he dies. Next oldest marries her, he dies, the next, and the next. In other words, everybody, every time one of these guys marries this woman, they die. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know what I've never been able to figure out? Think about this. If you're the last brother, how come you're still hanging around? But then they said to him, they said, so Jesus, after all these guys marry her and they die and they go up to heaven, Jesus, when the, when, the, when the woman herself finally dies and she goes up to heaven and she sees all seven of them, Jesus, which one of them is she married to? And the question was a nonsense question. The Sadducees who asked it really didn't care. How do we know? Because it's a question about resurrection. And the Bible says the Sadducees didn't even believe in resurrection. They didn't care what the answer was. They didn't believe in the concept. So why even ask? There's only one motivation, to investigate, examine, and inspect the lamb, Jesus the lamb, during the same four-day period that the physical lambs are going through the same thing. End of the four-day period, the morning of the day of preparation, Lambs are brought out in the streets, led by the high priest to their place of sacrifice. It began at approximately the third hour or nine o'clock in the morning. Same day, same time. Jesus, our lamb, led in a procession through the streets by the high priest to his place of sacrifice, which the Bible tells you began at what time? Nine in the morning. Now you know why. A sacrifice of the physical lambs went on for the next six hours. Uh, how many hours does the Bible tell you that Christ tarried on the cross? Now you know why. When the sacrifice of the physical lambs was done, the high priest said, it is finished. And it was three o'clock. When Christ's sacrifice was done, it was three o'clock. And the book of Hebrews says that when he was placed on that cross, he didn't just become our once and for all sacrifice. He also became our once and for all high priest. And that's why it was he and he alone who said, it is finished. The story of Passover is so rich. And, and from the days of old, even before that, it was always meant to speak about Christ. He was, he is, and he always will be the Passover lamb in every respect. And the interesting part of all of this is that 2,000 years later, there are so many who have been taught that, well, you know, Passover, that's a, a Jewish festival. We're Christians. We don't need to bother with us. doesn't have anything to do with us or Jesus at all. And 
How many of you know we found out, many of us are first timers, a lot differently tonight? What we found is this always was, is, and it always will be about Christ. We found Jesus in places in Scripture where he's been waiting for us. We just never knew where to look. And the beautiful thing is that, especially for you first-timers, you're going to remember tonight for the rest of your lives. And each year when Passover comes, what a blessing, because it'll speak to us in a newer and greater way and remind us something else about Jesus to bring him closer to our hearts that maybe we would never have known had we not shown up tonight. But we did. And now we have him in that greater respect. And you know what? That's cause for praise. And it's probably why your fourth and final cup, which you can lift up now, is called your cup of praise. Lord, we praise you. And we thank you for the Passover story, which tonight many of us found out always was, is, and always will be about Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for showing us our Passover lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and having us learn about him in so many more respects to bring him closer to our lives and our hearts. In Christ Jesus' name, and everyone agreed and said, you can finish the rest of the grape juice in your cup if you'd like. Mm, praise the Lord. Now, our Seder formally ends with everyone saying three Hebrew words. And you guys did great with like charosis and dayenu, so this should be fairly easy for you. It's three Hebrew words. Some of them are long, so I'll break them up in syllables for you, and you'll say them, and then I'll let you know what you said. So here's, here's the first word. <clears throat> here, here, here's the first word. Everybody say, le sha -na. -na. That was good. Here's the second word. ha ba -a. Ha -ba -a. Good. Now, the, the third word has a couple of syllables, so we'll take it one by one. Biru, Biru. sha -na. layim. That was great. Three Hebrew words. Would you like to know what you just said? Okay, means. Attention, Walmart shop. No, it doesn't. <laughs> it means, it means, next year in Jerusalem. That whether it's during Passover time or any other time, what a wonderful blessing it would be to be able to go to the Holy Land and walk where Jesus walked. Experience him in ministry and see him as the Passover lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Many of us might not yet have been able to do that, but we sure got a lot closer to him tonight, didn't we? You can give God praise. It's been a great night. Great, great night. Cause for praise. Praise the Lord. Now, yep. Now, uh, Greg, you are holding something. Tell me what that is, Greg. Are those the kitty packs? Excellent. Now, Guys, you will find on your tables unopened, unless you're a particular 32-year-old, well, well, never mind, we're not going to wrap. <laughs> unopened, these packs that are for the kids that in them have things like marshmallows and plastic frogs to resemble or to remind us of some of the plagues that we talked about tonight. And you know what, Craig? I'm going to invite the kids. If they want, they can kind of shoot the frogs in here. But, but the marshmallows, take those home with you. Don't throw the marshmallows around because, man, when we vacuum those things, you'll never get them out of the carpet. Okay? They're, oh, they're dehydrated. I don't know what that means. Oh, they're not sticky anymore. Well, <laughs> I don't know if I can top that one. But, but guys, those, uh, those are for you. Oh, by the way, <clears throat> as, we, as we finish up, as we finish up, table leaders... Got a couple of closing announcements here for you. First of all, table, table leaders, I need you to do one more assignment for me. The lamb shank bones that you have on your tables, if you would bring all of those lamb shank bones here over to table 11, if you would place them on the table. Please do not bring them home to Fido or Buster. <laughs> because, because just like you guys were able to be blessed with these shank bones, um, when is it? Yeah, tomorrow night, I am at a church in Fort Collins. We're doing a Passover Seder, and they need these bones for their Seder too. So let's, let's make sure we bless them. Just put that over here on table 11 so I can bring 
the shank bones over to them as well. Really appreciate that. Just leave it on table 11. And yes, table leaders, take a minute to do that now so you don't forget. There you go. Appreciate that. Mm. Oh, my. There you go. Thank you. Appreciate that so much. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and after you do that, after you do that, just, uh, just head back to your tables. Take a seat for a few minutes. Before we let you go, let me just get everybody seated for a minute or so. Good shot there, Abby. <laughs> right over there. Thank you, brother, so much. So... As we close, <laughs> good job, Kevin. So as, uh, as we close, everybody, I know that uh, a number of you, when you were coming in, shh, a number of you, when you were coming in, you asked me about some of the materials that we have out on our materials uh, table. I'll tell you about, uh, about them now. But by the way, actually, when you came, on your tables right now, you'll also see some cards from Jewish Voice Ministries International with Rabbi Jonathan Burnus. Anybody ever heard of that ministry? So glad to see no hands, absolutely none in the room. A couple of you, good. All right, I'll talk about them in a minute. I serve as their staff evangelist. But some of you were asking about the materials on our table. Let me tell you about a few of them that I have. This is, and it's amazing, it's heavy. It's called the Jewish Voice Study Bible. It's heavy as a good study Bible should be. It has over 70 maps, charts, graphs, and articles in here. If you are somebody who wants to read the Bible and make sure that what you're reading is as close to the original Hebrew of the Old Testament and the original Greek of the New Testament, this is incredible. And let me tell you why. Uh, as, as a rabbi, but as a pastor, I look through all different Bible versions because I know what the original language says, and then I see if the English agrees. There's one Bible verse. If you want to know if you've got a Bible that's spot on, you should go to it first. It's Romans 10.4. The vast majority of Bibles translate that incorrectly because Romans 10.4 in most Bibles says this, for Christ is the end of the law. Really, really not a good translation. Here's why. Is the law ended or is it still alive? Answer, it's both. That's why Paul can say in Romans 7, in some verses, you're no longer under the law. But in other verses in Romans 7, he could say the law is holy, righteous, good, spiritual, and I delight in it. How can he say both? He's referring to the penalty of a law that's done away with, but the principle is eternal. Let me give you an example. Leviticus 17.11. It's the blood that makes atonement for our souls. Do we sacrifice animals anymore? No, thank God. That's the penalty that's dead. But isn't blood still necessary for our atonement? Sure, it's just that the blood of Jesus now. But if you say that the law itself is ended, you're throwing out both, and it's a mistranslation. Plus, the Greek word in there for end in Romans 10, 4, it's pronounced telos. And it doesn't mean overdone with gone. It means purpose, target, goal, or culmination. It's what you're leading up to. So when somebody gave me this Bible and they said, check it out, I turned to Romans 10, 4, and it says, for Christ is the culmination of the law. I said, thank you. That's the way a Bible should read. I go through so many. It's incredible. Try and pick it up if you can. This book is called Confessing the Hebrew Scriptures. We at Jewish Voice Ministries get a lot of calls from people who say, I have someone who's sick. I want to pray a Bible verse over them, and I want to pray that Bible verse in Hebrew, but I don't know Hebrew. So we said, let's make it possible for you. We produced a series of these books where on every left-hand page, there's a beautiful full-color photo of a scene in Jerusalem. This is right across, by the way, from the old city near the Garden of Gethsemane. On every right-hand page, you get a Bible verse in English about healing. Under that, you see it in its original Hebrew language. And under that, it's an English transliteration so that theoretically, theoretically, 
When you're reading the transliteration, you're saying the actual Hebrew, but it doesn't always work out that way because, yes, you're speaking English, but how many of you know not everybody speaks the same English? <laughs> Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. I spend a lot of time in places like Saskatchewan and Alberta, Canada. They speak English. We speak English. We don't speak the same English. For example, uh, here we would say, I'm backing my car out of the garage to go to City Market to buy processed cheese. They don't do that in Canada. In Canada, they back their car out of the garage to go to Sobeys to buy processed cheese. <laughs> so how do you know if you're saying the transliteration right? Because it's only as good as the English regionalism that you know. How can you be sure you're speaking the Hebrew? Because we put a CD in the back to get the Hebrew right for you. It's a fantastic book. This book, How to Share Yeshua, how do you share Jesus specifically with Jewish people? Hint, don't take them through the Roman road. They don't follow the New Testament. But this will show you how to lead them to Christ from the Old Testament. The Lion of Judah is a wonderful little book written by Rabbi Kirk Schneider, who has a television show, who shows that in the first century, believe it or not, Jews and Gentiles in the Roman Empire used to worship God, Jesus, together under one roof. And then there was a split. We all know that that happened, but how does it happen? How did it happen? And he brings us through the history. And last but certainly not least, because I have many other materials on the table, this, and some of you are looking at, this is sterling silver. It's a Star of David necklace or a Star of David or Star of Israel necklace. It's absolutely beautiful. In it, though, inside this star, you will see lines and curves. They are Hebrew letters that when you sound them out, they spell out the word Yeshua, Jesus' name in Hebrew. So that's what we've got for you over there. And by the way, the cards on your tables, um, I, I would love it if you would fill those cards out. Let me tell you why. God says in Genesis 3, I will bless those who bless Israel. Guys, you have come tonight, whether you know it or not, you've blessed Israel. Let us bless you back. If you fill out the cards on the front, first of all, we want to keep you informed on what's going on in Israel. Uh, God says in Psalm 122, 6, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. How can you pray for Jerusalem if you don't know what's going on there? So we want to keep you updated. So even as I'm talking right now, if you would feel free, fill out the front of the card, name, address, phone, etc. What I'll do, I'll bring those cards back with me to Jewish Voice Ministries, and yeah, we'll get you on our mailing list. And listen, you don't have to worry. First of all, anything we send you voluntarily remains free. Number two, no, we won't stuff your, your mailbox. And number three, no, we don't sell your name to telemarketers. At least not anymore. But anyway, <laughs> just wanted to make sure you were listening. Fill out the card. On the bottom of the card, I want to talk about one of the boxes. It says, go. We, for the past 25 years, have been going, and I've been going to places like Ethiopia, Zambia, Zimbabwe, India. We hold medical missions outreach clinics there. There are people in these countries who are dying from things we take an aspirin to remedy, and it's heartbreaking. So what we've been doing, and we do about eight of these a year, we go to these countries and we bring with us doctors, dentists, eye surgeons, triage nurses, anyone who works in the medical field, and we hold a medical clinic. Last one that I was on was in a place called Mas Vingo, Zimbabwe. We're there for five days. In five days, our medical team treated more than 10,000 people in five days. Incredible. When we do this for them, they want to know, why are you doing this for us? You don't know who we are. You've come from the other side of the world. What do you want? And it's a legitimate question for them to ask. And we give a very legitimate answer. We say, we're doing this for you because the God we believe in loves you. And he sent us to show you his love for you so that you would be healed. You want to talk about a testimony to bring people to Christ. That'll do it. Many of them say, I want to know more about this God. And we invite them to come into our prayer room to receive prayer. So in that medical clinic that I was on, five days, 10,000 people, about 35%, 3,500 of them, came into our prayer room willing to receive prayer and hear more about Christ. And of that 3,500, I'll never forget, 1,462 gave their lives to Jesus. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. So if you work in the medical field, 
check the go box. We need you to come with us on a medical clinic because the more medical personnel we have, the more people that we can treat and share the gospel with. If you don't work in the medical field, check the go box because you don't need a medical degree to share the gospel with someone. And, and listen, don't worry. Don't feel hesitant about checking the go box. You're not signing your life away. It doesn't mean I'm putting you on a plane to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia tomorrow. I'll wait until Wednesday. But anyway, that's what that's about. And finally, let me tell you about the back of the card. because uh, And Pastor, thank you, by the way. <clears throat> uh, uh, we're going to receive a, a, a love offering for Jewish Voice Ministries International tonight. And that's what the back of the card is for. Let me tell you really quickly about the ministry because I want you to know what you're giving to. I don't want you to give to a ministry just because you had a speaker here who presented a Passover Seder that you like. This is a ministry that years ago recognized that what Paul said in Romans 1.16 is eternal. He said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. How many of you know that'll preach? He said, and he continued, he said, for it is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe to the Jews and to the nations. And for more than 60 years, we have been bringing the gospel all across the world to each and every one we can find. You know, Jesus says in the Olivet Discourse, he said the gospel must be preached to all nations and then we, the end will come. That's what we've been doing. So we make sure that people hear the word of God. But let me tell you where your offering specifically would be going to from tonight because you should know where your money's going when you give it away. Many of you know what happened in Israel on October 7th. Many of you heard about places that are now commonplace, places with names like Kifar Aza and Kibbutz Be'eri. The people there, as you know, are devastated. We work with 85 partner ministries on the ground in Israel who every single day are providing food, clothing, shelter, housing, transportation to those thousands of people <clears throat> in southern Israel who are displaced from their homes because of the attacks from Hamas. We also share the gospel with them to give them hope. The finances also go to IDF soldiers in the field in the Gaza Strip. It's cold there. Many of them are in need of jackets. Many of them are in need of artillery. Just the other day, the country of Canada said, we are putting a ban on any further arms exports to Israel. My friends, it's a shame. You have the entire world practically committing or accusing Israel of genocide when the fact of the matter is that Israel has been doing everything it can to protect innocent lives, and Hamas has been doing everything it can to kill innocent lives of its own people. Israel could really need and use your support right now. That's where your offering is going to. So what I'll do in a minute is I'm going to close with a blessing that I did last year too. It's from the book of Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. It's the priestly blessing. Here's what I'll do. I'll say it over you first in English, <clears throat> and then after I get the remaining horseradish and parsley out of my throat, I will sing it over you in the Hebrew. And after I do that, give me about a 10 second head start to get to my materials table in case you want to pick up materials or, or if you'd like to give me your cards and, uh, and any offering that you might want to give with that, that's entirely up to you. Amen. By the way, you glad you came tonight? Mm. I'm glad you came tonight too. Thank you so, so much for coming. And uh, let me send you off now with this blessing to each and every one who's come at our second, second ever Seder here at Calvary Chapel in Grand Junction, Colorado. It's great to see all of you again, and I look forward to it the next time as well. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord our God lift up his countenance upon you and may he grant you his peace. And sung in the Hebrew sounds this way. Hear 
خا و هی خون خا یهی سو ادونای پونو و ایل خا وی آسم لخا شلو And all of God's people said,